Uh, looks like we are live. I would like to welcome everybody. John Longshore and Jeffrey, thanks for stopping by to the Monday counterclipping stream. So we are today clipping Lucky Forward. Uh, it'd be nice to finish this guy. I kind of start clipping it when, uh, when it showed up. And I just got distracted by other projects. So let's pull our chat out. Let's send out the tweets, which I didn't get ready in advance, which was dumb. Let's see if we have any typos in there. Looks good. So we have recently just wrapped up, of course, the Armchair Dragoons digital convention, the latest digital convention from the Armchair Dragoons, which was uh, a booming success uh, from what I gather. If you'd like to hear the, the wrap up, uh, from the end to check out the, the live stream from yesterday that's now up on the channel with Brant and I talking about how well everything went. Sean and Husa and Chet, thanks for stopping by. Uh, the rotation, the, the, the libation rotation tonight is Rittenhouse Rye, which I had, had, had recommended to me. Um, it's about 20, it's a bottled in bond, 100 proof, um, 100 proof, yes. Um, which is a requirement for a bottled in bond, which is a, a sort of weird and somewhat archaic U.S. thing. Um, it's okay. It's um, more, but it, it'll be really good for cocktails, and it was not terribly, terribly expensive. It's a little stout as uh, drinking it neat goes, I think. F.S. Mora, thanks for stopping by. Our topic for the evening is Monster War Games, uh, which we will get to. And actually, I guess since I mentioned that, um, we are in fact right this moment clipping a Monster War Game. So it was kind of a matter of which Monster War Game we were going to get busy with uh, clipping this evening. Now, it was going to be this or the Blitzkrieg Legend, OCS Blitzkrieg Legend, but I did, it turned out, I, and actually that's what I was going to do, um, I just, and I, it's not here, <laughs> it's, it's upstairs, so I did not have it handy in time, so, famous, uh, listening Seattle, thanks for stopping by, uh, we're still having, you know, COVID weird symptoms, like weird midday crashes, where I have to crash and sleep for several hours, um, uh, and or my sense of uh, taste is not back yet. Yeah, sense of smell is like comes and goes. Uh, taste is definitely not back yet. I had a salad where literally all I could taste was the sugar in the salad dressing. Um, it was weird. So uh, this is the first appearance on the counter clipping stream for at least several weeks of the two millimeter clipper. Uh, it's a little bit squeaky. I cleaned it out and it's was fine for about a game's worth of counters, and then it started getting a little squeaky again, but it's not too bad. Uh, Terrence, thanks for thanks for that uh, on the OCS boot camp. Uh, I was reasonably... Pl I felt inarticulate the whole time, to be completely honest. It definitely wasn't as smooth as I could manage <clears throat> to be. But uh, at the same time, I'm, I'm also... Uh, there, there was at least one rule script, which is in the comments to the video. And... Uh, it's a pretty minor screw up. It wouldn't have made a difference. Uh, it's just one of the overruns that was actually not a legit overrun. It would have been a perfectly fine um, regular combat with all the same modifiers and and uh, details. It just it didn't qualify for for an overrun. So uh, actually, uh, Kaiser Bill, that's why I'm drinking bourbon right now because I'm more than more of a Scotch guy. So. Uh, I might as well save the Kalila for. I almost did that tonight. I'm th then I thought, yeah, we'll do the we'll do the rye tonight. 
Because I haven't done the Ryan stream yet. So, I just got it. Like I said, it was about a bottle of it. It's about 20... Let me turn that off. Because that'll be annoying. A bottle of it is about 25 bucks here in Ohio. Ohio's super weird with liquor. Um, essentially, and a number of other states are like this too. Uh you're basically buying your booze from the state of Ohio. Oh, gee, Devin, thanks for stopping by. Uh, it does look like uh, your stuff at the Armchair Dragoons event uh, was a booming too. Big time, in fact. So, Craig Campbell, hello from Ontario. Thank you for coming by. Let me check. There we go. That's what I want. I had a last-minute uh, bitrate issue with the stream. Um, this isn't something that is a problem if I'm using, say, StreamYard, which we were using last night. Um, but it is a, potentially an issue uh, with OBS, where, where I'm actually capturing the video myself um, and then sending it directly to YouTube. Um, the bitrate was too high. I mean, I don't know what harm it would have caused, but... So John Longshore mentioned the Kirkland Special Edition Bourbon. Um, that is not something we can get here in Ohio. Uh, that's too bad too, because Costco, if you can, the, the Costco Bourbon and Costco Scotch is actually a really good deal um, if you can get it, but you can't sell it here in Ohio because of the, the liquor laws. Like I said, you're buying it from the state. Um, interestingly, I found that. Uh, despite a lot of other things, especially housing costs, but, but you know, some other things too, being more expensive in California than they are elsewhere, uh, the cost of booze is noticeably lower in California than it is here in Ohio. That's irritating. Incidentally, the Stranahan's uh, Colorado, Bur uh, Colorado whiskey, it's not bourbon, that I got out in Colorado, you can get here. So I just, I just saw it in the liquor store the other day. When I was in the liquor store the other day. Uh, it's pretty good, by the way. I do recommend it. Yep, Stigler, thanks for stopping by. I completely agree. This, the state liquor store is a, it's, it's, it's a ridiculous racket. Um, and there's... The, the, the workaround has basically been to license other stores to operate a state store inside them and it's it's really mickey mouse it would just be better if you were just able to engage in capitalism with regards to booze i would be much happier so let me start messing up rules thanks for stopping by let me start in on um the monster war game topic now as as i think probably everybody is aware um we do a lot of what would typically be called monster gaming. So there's this kind of two topics I want to touch on. One thing is what is a monster game? What, what makes it qualify for, for being a monster game? And the other is, although we'll dig into this in detail, um, obviously it's a lot of trouble to play a monster game. It's more trouble to play a monster game than it is to play a game that takes two hours. Um, why is it worth it if it is, in fact, worth it? So, I mean, everybody is going to say, is going to put their dividing line for non-monster games and monster games in a different place. Uh, Marco, for example, described, I think I think it was the Dark Valley, described the Dark Valley as a monster game. Um, I don't think it is um so i guess here's where i would draw the line a regular gaming convention right it, a, a traditional gaming convention we're not talking about constant world or war game specialized events which has specifically been designed to accommodate these kinds of games is three or four days it's starts maybe on friday or thursday and runs through sunday if you can play it at that kind of event that three three or four day event um then i don't think it's a monster game maybe it's a mini monster um that's fair and this this isn't to say that uh you have to agree with my particular definition on this either but but to me that's where i feel where it where it's at right if you can finish playing it 
Um, that doesn't necessarily have to be finished as in played to the very last turn, right? I mean, I mean, I mean finished as in has come to a reasonable state of conclusion. Um, that's completely fine. Um, if you can do that, like, so th this means that, uh, so I, I've mentioned this before, Lou Pulsifer did a video a week or a couple weeks ago, uh, where he talked about the victory game Civil War being a monster game. And, and no, it's, I don't think so. Um, it's, I, I've also heard that Empire of the Sun is a monster game to some people, which is, I think, completely transparently ridiculous. Um, Victory Game Civil War does have two maps. One of those maps is the West map, which on which relatively little activity will take place, and very little of the actual playtime will be consumed. Um, so, I mean, I don't... And you can play... It's, it's a, probably a 20-hour game to play, right? So you can easily play that in t two or three... Two to four sessions, right? If you have a three-day wargaming convention, you can absolutely play Victory Games Civil War without without problem to completion, even if you are playing to the very last turn. So it can take up a reasonable amount of space. Reasonable, not, not huge, right? If, if we're talking about four maps, then I don't I don't use the, the map area as the barometer of whether it's a monster game or not, I use playtime. However, that said, I am unaware of any four-map games or larger that are really not monster games. Um, certainly, you could play, say, Stonewall in the Valley, which is a three-map game. You could play that in a, in a non-monster way, but you could also play it in a monster way, too, if you want to play a, that entire relatively long campaign. John Longshore mentioned up thread a little bit the what I would call one of the ultimate monster games, which is of course SPI's War in Europe, which I have played. Um, it is nine maps. Uh, I believe the original came with something like thirty two hundred counters or something like that. Um, it is not especially complicated for a game of its topic and and size, um, but. It's, you know, it's going to take you quite a long time to play. It's going to take you 50 plus hours to play it, right? Uh, any of the, the larger Labatt games are going to take more than 50 hours to play. And again, you know, different people will, will define this differently. But I, I find it's better to define it by playtime rather than by map space. But there's a correlation there between playtime and map space as well. Um... Stigler says it's got to be two plus full size maps. Certainly, there are two map games that are monster games. Um, the Dark Valley, I think, is one that kind of sits on the edge. Um, the Victory can it, the Dark Valley is a two map game, right? For those not familiar, it's a Ted Racer game. Uh, it's a chip pull system. It's a it's a very nice game. Uh, East Front, and it's a two map game, right? And it could take longer than a weekend to play. However, the victory conditions are structured such that sometime around 1942, you're going to have a pretty good idea, usually, you're going to have a pretty good idea of who is going to win or lose that game. So, it is kind of on the border of, is this a monster game or isn't it? It's fairly large. I mean, it's got about 1,200 pieces or something like that. That's, that's good sized. Um... Occasional Gamer, thanks for stopping by. We are drinking Rittenhouse Rye this evening, bottled in Bond. Uh, which I personally don't think really means much, other than it's it's a guarantee that it's 50%, uh, bottled at 50%, which is, which is atypical for American bourbon. So, Terrence, I completely, you, you mentioned that a monster uh, can only be played and finished if you're retired. I completely disagree with that. Um, that, that is, I am quite far from retired, and that is something that we do, uh, you know, no, under normal circumstances anyway, not right now, on a weekly basis here, is we have a monster game or two set up at any given time that we are playing. Uh, that, you know, means that we're playing, you know, in, in three to four hour sessions a week. And uh, that means that it might take a very long time to finish, right? Our second front game, which I would definitely consider a monster game, took us about a year and a half uh, of play. And we played it from beginning to bitter, bitter end. Uh, we started with the invasion of Sicily. 
and in July of 1943, and we ended in May of 1945 with a, a relatively narrow German victory on on points, but it was really because the Allies had tried to get creative with a uh, early amphibious landings in northern Italy, and th those did not go well. So, um, so Stigler mentions, I'm going to bounce up and down in the chat here, Stigler mentions that size does not equal complexity at all. Yes, that's correct, and in fact, war in Europe is a pretty good... Um, example of that it's not particularly now i'm talking about the, the spi one right i haven't played the decision one it's it's one of those where i believe it to be basically the same game um but it's it's not particularly complicated um it's enormous and it'll take you a long time to play but it is not particularly complicated um on the other hand this thing goss any of the goss games which somebody has also mentioned occasional gamer mentions that any of the Goss games qualify. Yeah, I'd agree. Uh, the smallest Goss game at this time is uh, Hurtgen Hell's Forest. Um, it's nominally two maps, but one of the about a third of one of the maps is the turn record track. Uh, so it's actually a, a, a bit less than two full maps. And despite that, the fact that it's a relatively small footprint. If you're playing the whole campaign, it's going to take you longer than three or four days of convention play to get through it, um, from experience. Uh, not that I've played Herkin Forest, but I've played Goss, right? And it's it's a, it's not a it's not fast paced, right? Um, and in in fact, that's a that's a liability for monster games um, is the pace sometimes. Now, personally, let me uh, let me catch up on the uh, on the chat here. Kaiser Bill uh, mentions Vak dem Rhein from Decision. Either version of Vak dem Rhein, really. I think Objective Moscow from SPI. Uh, Objective Moscow is really quite a neat game, actually. Um, Stigler mentions Desert Fox Deluxe, which I agree. It, so that's seven maps, but they're not seven full-size maps. And there's a lot of there's a lot of lulls in there, and um, I don't have a sense of how long it would take to play. So it certainly it takes up a lot of space. Um, and it's, it's, uh, you'd kind of have to see it. There's no way for me to adequately describe it verbally without showing you a picture of it, which I'm not going to go do. Uh, but it's, it's, you know, it traces the core, the coast of North Africa. Um, so you have kind of like map, 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 kind of diagonally across two large tables. Um, I don't have a sense of how, uh, and it, it, it eats a lot of space, even though I think only like two maybe of those are full size maps. But I also, it's, it's also a relatively easy system. It dates from the old SPI Desert Fox, and I believe it to play fairly quickly, but I don't have a sense of how long that takes. So I, I, I'm going to defer judgment on Desert Fox Deluxe. Um, I am aware that the decision um, boxed edition of the game does have some presentation problems. Um, I am not sure that those presentation problems are quite as critical as has been described by certain persons in the past. Not saying they're wrong. I don't own it. I can't make a judgment. I'm just, I'm not convinced. Um, Stigler asks, how many maps did Descent on Crete have? Um, I thought it was two. I could be, I could be wrong about that. It has been uh, multiple decades since I have looked inside a copy of Descent on Crete. Sean Baldwin uh, mentions uh, Whiff and A World at War. Yes, I would absolutely agree with those. Those are definitely monsters. And in fact, um, if you want to talk about... So if, if you just look at the maps uh, for World of Flames and A World at War, right? They're, they're each four map games, basically, right? You have two Europe maps, two Pacific maps. And then Whiff has a couple extra maps on top of that. But... Trying to keep these sorted by formation here. But uh, WIF has a, a need for an enormous additional quantity of table space between, you know, it's, you know, the America map and the Scandinavia map and maybe an Africa map. And then you have all the all the different chip pools that you have and a couple other displays. Um, World, uh, World of War also has a couple other displays. 
these games are both world at war specifically is is really near the very top end of the complexity scale too i don't think a really complicated game so a a really complicated non-monster game you know any of these if you're playing with the advanced rules uh, i don't think i mean maybe that big world war three in asia thing it qualifies as a monster, but that's a, that's a quite complicated system without being a monster, necessarily. Uh, Messing Up Rules asks, Phase 10. I am not sure what that is. Craig Campbell mentions GDW's Third World War. Yeah, if you just play, uh, say, uh, Battle for... Uh, what was it called? The, the 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 central one the, the the main one that was actually just called third the third world war uh where it's just the battle over like central germany um that's probably not a monster by itself uh but if you put all four games together or even three games together which is how we played it um we left out persian gulf just because it, it's like a huge additional chunk of map space uh then yeah that totally qualifies as a monster game John Longshore mentions the Second World War from Diffraction Entertainment. That definitely qualifies. Um, uh, also, any of the <clears throat> somewhat related Europa titles also qualify as Monster War games. <clears throat> John Longshore says that Desert Fox Deluxe takes two hours to set up and two minutes to toss back into the box, two minutes to burn it. Okay, see, I hadn't heard that from you, so... Uh, it, it may be that it is, in fact, not worthwhile. And 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 let's face it, um, I'm sitting here clipping a Decision Games title, and I have been on the record for a long time as having been a fan of Goss, and certainly Decision has some titles that are good titles. Uh, but they also have a, a respectably large number of titles that are not respectable, if you know what I mean. So, um, I would advise uh, caution and do your research before buying a Decision Games game. Because some of them are good, but a lot of them are not. Phase 10 is a card game, very simple, best played drunk. Okay, I have no idea then. No idea. Stig <laughs> Stigler mentions The Creature That Ate Sheboygan, which is a game I've always wanted to play, actually, and I've never played it. Uh, it was just one of those things that uh, was never getting played in my, in my circle. Whatever circle I happened to be in at the time. So Charles Latora mentions Campaign for North Africa, which, you know, Campaign for North Africa is probably worth uh, worth a whole video um, on its own, and I'm not going to be the guy that does that video, because I don't own it, I've never played it, I've never tried to play it, and I'm not going to. Um, but, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of got a, a, a cultural cachet, both inside the wargaming hobby and now outside it. Um, because of its infamy uh, for its rules overhead, right? Um, so, you know, it's unquestionably a monster game. Uh, somebody, Clay Stone, I think, is is uh, play, trying to play it, and he's posted pictures of it somewhere, I think on Facebook. And I gotta say, uh, it's pretty a late SPI game. It's pretty nice looking, actually, for an SPI game, right? I mean, you know, even by modern standards, the counters are nice looking, the map is nice looking, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, really fairly attractive game for its era. I will say, uh, that, uh, from what I've seen of the new version of Goss, uh, rules so far the uh, the original well every previous edition to various extents uh, of the Goss rules has been a le greater or lesser disaster uh, but the current uh, version of the Goss rules is is pretty nice and Doug Johnson wrote that um, it's a it's it's a, looks pretty nice so far now I haven't actually played a game using it as a reference 
that might make it different, right? I might have to change my opinion based on that experience, uh, which will happen sooner or later. It's just, you know, it doesn't look like it's going to happen that soon. We've There is some movement toward getting a stream game of it going, but I'm unconvinced that it will be good quality streaming fodder because of uh, its pacing. Uh, I've been on the record for saying that OCS is an example of a game that is not good for streaming content because it's so slow. Um, now, that's not something that bothers me, right? I am perfectly happy to say, okay, it's your turn. It's going to take you two hours to go. I'm going to go eat or shop or take a nap or whatever. I'm, I'm completely comfortable or wander around taking pictures of other people's games. I'm completely comfortable with that. Um, if we're playing it locally, uh, it's actually a little more awkward, but, but then we can say, okay, it's your movement fit. We do this with OCS all the time. We basically play until it's the other guy who's, whose house we're playing at's movement phase, and then we're done. And then he'll do his movement phase. And then when we get there the next week, he will start with his overruns than anything that else that requires interactivity. Um, and it works out pretty well. Uh, Sagacious Hamster mentions that CNA was a computer game without the computer. Yeah, that's a great way to put it, actually. Except that almost no computer war games actually have that level of detail. Uh, seriously, they, they just don't. They're, they're, a, a, many of them are, too many of them are just really simplistic, hand-wavy simulation, attempted simulations or pseudo-simulations behind the scenes. There are exceptions. The, uh, the other thing is that Decision's um, release pace is set by the magazines, even if, if, like this, for example, is not a magazine game. Um, and that can and negatively impact... Um, that can negatively impact the quality of the released product. Uh, this is something that uh, Pulsifer mentioned, actually, is that, in his opinion... He didn't say in his opinion. He just said it. Um, but, you know, we take it. We're, we're grown-ups. We take it as in his opinion. Um, monster games are never play-tested. Now, that's, that's not true. Um, I can absolutely vouch for personal experience that the OCS monster games, all, all of which are monster games, with the possible two exceptions, um, are, in fact, exhaustively play-tested. Um the third winner, which is the currently closest to pre-order posting OCS game, for example, is absolutely going to be 100% thoroughly play-tested to death by the time it even... And it's not even on pre-order yet, right? Um, very thoroughly play-tested uh, by, by, uh, by the OCS honchos and, and company. Um, so, and... I personally have only playtested Third Winner. Um, looks like we might be op getting opened up to a, a new playtest item that's less, much less far along in the pipeline. Uh, so, Brent, thanks for stopping by. How are you in here as both Dragoon Commander and Bayonet Brand? So, or did you just switch over? This is for those asking and who who have showed up late. This is uh, Rittenhouse Rye. Stigler, I don't doubt that. Now, it's absolutely true to say that some monster games are not sufficiently playtested, right? That's a completely fair thing to say, and it's and it's completely accurate. Um, I can think of every uh, monster game from Decision, for example, not particularly thoroughly tested. Um, there are versions of um, well, we're, I don't want to. I don't want to change the topic of the stream to let's let's all complain about decision let me put it that way um but we can all come up with examples right of of large games and small games but large games i mean it's harder to play test large games right it's obviously harder to play test large games because they take longer to play test one uh i think fairly notorious example is the decision games uh version of war in the pacific now you know War in the Pacific, I guess, I guess I've guess i never played either version. The original SPI, War in the Pacific, I, I believe has its problems. But the uh, revised 
War in the Pacific from Decision, which is a considerably different game, uh, is was absolutely not. There is no way that was playtested. Um, there is simply no way that was playtested. Um, now, like uh, Time for Trumpets, I believe that to have been adequate. You know, big, big or not, I believe that to have been adequately adequately playtested. It's taken years to to beat it into shape because it's a big game, right? Um, but nevertheless, it is now, you know, it is now play tested and released. Uh, I have no doubt that the Victory Game Civil War was was pretty thoroughly play tested too. That thing's a, a masterful game design, um, completely completely solid. So um, it, it's a concern that you might have on a monster game. Now the other kind, of like the the Boutsen uh, Labatt game that just came out, that's a that's a joke. That wasn't play tested at all. Um, there's plenty of examples of of Maybe the majority of, of monster games, in fact, probably the majority of monster games, are not given enough time in playtesting because it is challenging to give them enough time in playtesting because the games are so big. Um, so, Dan, thanks for stopping by. H. Tuna, thank you for stopping by. Yeah, Brent says if we started complaining about decision, we'd be here till Wednesday. Perhaps this will be the subject of one of those 24-7 streams that we run for the next Armchair Dragoons virtual convention. Um, <laughs> let's complain about decision for three days. That would be funny. Um, possibly not for decision. Uh, Brent mentions that the coin games are wrangled by a solid crew over at least a year each before release. Yes, but the coin games are also games that you can play in, in a long afternoon. So those are not... Um, I, I don't believe those to be, um, monster games. I don't think those are in the same category as what we're talking about. Uh, Time for Trumpets, uh, Terrence mentions that he thinks it's borderline monster. I think it's a legit monster. Um, it, two years ago, I think, at Winterfest, which is a week-long event, right, um, there were two tables of that running as overseen by Bruno, and they took, they were, they played it all week. So if, uh, I, I believe that it qualified. Now it may well have smaller scenarios that do not quite take as long, but I, I believe Time for Trumpets absolutely qualifies. Um, another thing that I think is going to qualify is the, uh, well, hopefully anyway, <clears throat> is the, uh, the reimagining of War Between the States from Don Johnson. That is Don doing that, right? Yeah, I believe it is. Um, uh, the, he's been playtesting that for some time. So I, I think that's going to... And that is coming... I'm not absolutely sure that that has a, a publisher lined up. I've kind of assumed that it was Compass. Uh, that Don't you know? Don't quote me on that as being in an actual contract somewhere. John Longshore mentioned that Napoleonic 18 millimeter battles are monsters. You just add a thousand hours to do all the painting, which is completely accurate. So help me God, I watched a video about miniature painting today, by the way. Um, I, I, I actually did, and I sat through an entire hour and a half miniature painting video. Uh, in this case, it was about painting Traveler Starship miniatures. So I, I gave it a special exemption from my no miniatures rule. And then I went online and looked at what, this, what the, the same miniatures cost, and I said, yep, I'm good. I'm, I'll make counters <laughs> if, I, if I need that. Brent mentioned that he would like to take the deck maps, which are pr pretty much a straight, really long 12, 15 foot line. I believe it's about 15 feet, like a scroll. And you can unroll them as the uh, campaign flows back and forth. Uh, it doesn't quite work, I think, just because of the way the um, because of the way the supply works. We might have to trace supply back to uh, Stolbrook or someplace like that. Um, so I'm not convinced that'll work, but it's a it's a cute idea. All right, let's see here. Uh, these are going in a. GMT counter tray for now. They will eventually land in a one of those plastic container store trays that I use. That's how I store my Goss counters. I'm thinking about uh, adopting those for GTS as well. 
actually, but we'll see. I need to, I need to buy them. And I, I keep going up to the container store and buying all they have, and it's like two or three. So that's a little irritating. Let's see here. But this uh, this tray is about full, actually, from an organizational standpoint, anyway. And yet we have another. Yeah, I mean, there's there is um, there are people who's elaborate and much more popular than my YouTube channels that just do that, that just you know paint miniatures, and that's that's you know if you're into that, that's awesome. It just doesn't help me very much. I only watch this because it was traveler related. Let's get ourselves some more counters to clip. Dan asks, what's a good alternative to DAC or DAC2 in today's market? So if you want sort of an operational thing that covers the entirety of North Africa, um, there's an old game from Quarter Deck Games called Rommel's War that I believe you can get for not a million dollars. So you might look into that. Um, there's also uh, the upcoming North Africa SCS game which if you're not of a mind to deal with the OCS uh, minutia, maybe uh, maybe you take a look at that. That's not out yet, but it should be out, I think, sometime this year, I, I think. I think it's made its number. I could be wrong. Um, and that's basically going to be DAC, but with SCS instead of OCS, if, if that's what you're into. Um, I, I think they're doubling up on the research. They're saying, hey, we did all this order of battle research. We might as well make two games <laughs> instead of just one, which makes sense. Um, the other one is Desert Fox Deluxe. But again, it, it's, it had a real good reputation when it was released in the magazine. And maybe they screwed the box version up. I don't know. Uh, Daniel asks if I tried chess extrays for counter storage. Yes, I don't prefer them um, because uh, they're one piece. So the... The, uh, they tend to turn into tiny counter catapults if you land on them wrong during the course of a game. That said, they fit without trimming into Avalon Hill boxes. So uh, where for those Avalon Hill games that I or Victory Games games, which is the same size box, games that I have, that's a good point. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, I, I've, I've used those Chessex counter trays just because they fit in the box. I don't like to trim the counter trays. Uh, Brand has mentioned that Columbia Games has just put Rommel in the Desert onto Kickstarter. Now, I think that's more of a strategic type of thing because of its scale than tactical, or not tactical, but operational. And certainly it's a, as a one-map thing. Now, I mentioned, though, that this is, this is as far as I'm aware, Columbia's first product with like a legit mounted map and not that cardstock map, that heavy paper type map that they've used in the past, which is not a type of map that I like. Um, it's like it's got all of the problems of a mounted map and all of the problems of an unmounted map. It's like it puckers. So you got to put Tuxie over it anyway. Um, you might as well just give me a paper map. Um, so this will be a legit mounted map. It's uh, it's uh, it's going to be an interesting product to see if you're a fan of the Columbia Games block system. And, and that system has a lot of fans, uh, and it's well regarded. It's not something that I am currently into. Uh, I have, however, considered it. <laughs> Because I've got a, I'll give you a little peek into behind the scenes of running a content creation stream here. I do have a relationship with Columbia Games, right? Now that I, I have intentionally limited that on purpose to their role playing stuff, uh, because I have so much more, more bandwidth for war games already that I, I just don't need them to send me free product for for war games. They, they do have some products that I do find appealing. Occasional Gamer mentions that RAF Eagle, which is part of the current RAF package, is a lot of fun. The D-Day Atari, the D-Day games, the John Butterfield D-Day games. I don't know about the Iwo Jima one, because that was designed by somebody else. But Butterfield did D-Day at Omaha Beach, D-Day at Palelu, and D-Day at Tarawa, and they're all outstanding. Um, so, again, examples of, of really good quality decision games. And the new versions have mounted maps, and their mounted maps are real nice. 
Um, I think they're counters. These, so these counters, let me mention this. I mentioned this in the unboxing video. There's an unboxing video, Lucky Forward, if you want to go check that out. Uh, are on a thicker brown core stock than Decision has heretofore used. Um, I like the thicker counters. I like the brown core thicker counters. Um, so I am happy about this. What they did do is they gave you the old marker sheets that are on the thinner white core stock, which is really, really half-assed. So... Um, I don't, I guess I don't have, I, so this is one of those games where I keep the markers in their own external separate trays. So I don't really have a huge problem with that, but it's, it's unattractive. Uh, Kaiser Bill mentions the Dark Sands. The Dark Sands is from GMT. Um, the one from Compass is going to be the Battle of the Bulge one, the Dark Woods or the, whatever that's called. I forget what it's called. Uh, it's going to be that same Ted Racer, chip pole type system. Uh, same system as the Dark Valley. I haven't played the Dark Sands. I've played the Dark Valley. The Dark Valley is excellent. Um, for some reason, he, there's a Normandy game, the Dark Summer, I think, coming from GMT in that sequence as well. And I'm just not super into that. Um, I, I, it, despite that it's a Normandy game, and I am super into Normandy games, to the point where I am thinking about that Grognard Simulations and Death Ride, Death Ride Normandy Malarkey, which is going to be like, I mean, just the Omaha Beach stuff is ends up being like three hundred and fifty dollars for the first week, maybe of the campaign, something like that. Uh, yeah, new uh, new record. We had we were up to I didn't see sixty, but we had uh, about fifty seven so far, which is itself a new record. Uh, Imperium Romanum, I think, doesn't so. I don't think it qualifies as a monster. Basically, and we've talked about. Um, I'm going to get. Uh, I'm going to get back, back to the chat here in a second. We've talked about Imperial Romana before on these streams. There isn't a campaign game, right? It's all scenarios. Now, some of those scenarios are big and long, but I don't think they'll take you a week to play. Um, so I don't think Imperial Romana. It's a big game, but I don't think it qualifies as a monster game. Uh, let's see here. Uh, half ass Gaming, thanks for stopping by. Missed out on an awesome winter offensive GCACW experience. I am aware. It's uh, it was it's totally Brant's fault for having scheduled his event, to which I had already committed uh, on the same weekend. Um, I watched a couple of the streams, uh, the developer streams. I did watch those because I wanted to know what was in the pipeline. So I'll mention that, actually. Uh, what's in the pipeline for... Uh, great campaigns in American Civil War. So the next thing is Hood Strikes North and the reprinted Stonewall Jackson's Way 2 with the new counter sheet. It's just an updated graphics counter sheet. It's the same counter sheet. Um, those are probably their best guess. Perry's best guess was mid-March um, to actually ship. So that's like right on the precipice. The next product is a three-module Gigundo package called On to Richmond 2, which will contain... On to Richmond 2, Grant Takes Command 2, and a, as far as I'm aware, unnamed module about the Petersburg campaign, all of which will take place on four, a big, big format package similar to uh, Roads to Gettysburg 2. It is going to be awesome, and I can't wait. They had the maps and in, in, in completely new maps that will match all the other maps in the series from, from series genius mapper Charlie Kibler and all that stuff. Now we're at a record of 62, by the way. So... But yeah, if I hadn't been committed to other things, I would totally have been all over that. Now that said, because of COVID, I'm having weird fatigue issues where I'll be like completely fine and then I'll just completely bottom out and I'll have to sleep for four hours in the middle of the day. So that's a thing that's happening. Um, and that is, you know, that is still going on a week or two into this bullshit now. So... <clears throat> um. So let's look at um, at the chat here. Uh, John, uh, Joe Loftus mentions the Second World War Mare Nostrum, which is also huge. Um, yeah, so Brant mentions that if you just want like a one map North Africa game, there are more options. If you want something comparable to Campaign for North Africa, except playable, or DAC, or DAC 2. DAC and DAC 2 are basically the same game. There, there's no significant differences they're just different versions of the same rules the differences are really small um 
Uh, we'll, uh, F.S. Mora, we'll get, we'll get to the mystique of monster games. There is a certain romance attached to the monster game that, uh, that's a legitimate thing. That, that's, there is, they are attractive simply because of that aura of mystery and difficulty and the, the idea that, oh, those guys playing the monster games have to be the super hardcore dudes, which is not really true, but, um, I believe Dark Sands to be relatively playable, and I, I don't believe it. Again, I haven't I don't own it. I haven't played it, but I don't. It doesn't look to be of monster game scope to me. Um, Grognard Sims said a Guinness record for largest war game. That might be true. I don't think that means anything. <laughs> so good, it, good for them that they have been paid zero dollars from the Guinness company uh, for getting that record in the book. So uh, definitely, Death Ride Curse is is stupidly large and that's a that's a, that so that death ride curse is actually in w many ways the ultimate so we're talking about the death ride series from grognard simulations chris fasulo and company and um it's like a platoon a company slash platoon level game on Kursk, which is crazy okay so i mean i guess they get a decent chunk of, they play it at, at uh consum world expo and they get a decent chunk of the way through it like you know they're not finishing a campaign or anything even though it's like a nine-day convention but um the rules look it, it it looks interesting but i'm not topically interested enough to, to in Kursk to to spend that kind of money, right? Normandy is another story. I've already spent two hundred fifty dollars on a Normandy game in the past, so um, it's not out of line, out of believability for me to actually pick that up at some point. John Longshore mentions that he, monster games he wants to see: the Mongol invasion, Alexander's campaigns to China, which didn't go that far, but it would be cool. U.S. Indian campaign, eighteen thirty to nineteen hundred, which would be a challenging topic politically um and a challenging topic design wise to be completely honest but but that's not to say that you couldn't make a good game on it i think maybe you could a u.s indigenous campaign done honestly would not be politically incorrect any more than say conquistador was uh it was conquistador uh i mean probably but I, it's been it's been decades since i have owned conquistador so i am i am I do not feel myself qualified to judge it at this time. It is a game I remember with some fondness, however, I'll tell you that. Well, the Normandy one uh, is going to be is going to be just as Death Ride Normandy is going to be just as bananas, um, if not more bananas. I guess they finished the Curse thing, so they're just going to you know do another giant ass campaign at the platoon level. So, um, I, I I respect what they're doing. And I think you can get a, a completely legitimate and cool game on the to topic of Normandy that only runs the first 10 days or 7 days or 14 days or whatever of the campaign. You don't have to run all the way to Cobra. Bigger games do, but um, <clears throat> uh, the Battle for Normandy does, at least if you have the expansion, and uh, Atlantic Wall does, and the longest day I'm not sure about. The Goss Atlantic Wall, not the original Atlantic Wall, which only which only runs, I think, to the end of June or something like that. Alan Salazar asks, any Napoleonic monsters? So it's funny you should mention that. Um, I think the first monster game was Drangnock Austin from GDW. Uh, the original edition of War in the East came out shortly thereafter. Um, now, of course, this is the progenitor of Fire in the East, the Europa series, blah, 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 blah. But, but another super, super early GDW monster game was considered a monster game at the time was the original La Bataille de la Moscova. Uh, now, that is a game that is that was in my hands temporarily at one point, the GDW version of that. And um, it, it's not nearly as complicated looking as later versions of the Labatt rule. So it, it may not qualify based on playtime i although i suspect it does um but it definitely qualifies in terms of map area because it's four it's four big maps it's a big game so i mean 
uh, all right. So let me let me hit the hit the chat in, more or less in order here. <clears throat> Brent, Brent mentions that uh, he remembers a book at Game Fest when uh, Dave, which was a friend of mine, uh, and somebody else had a giant Gettysburg game. Three is a Gettysburg. That would have been Three Dog. That uh, they weren't platoon. Those that's a regimental game. Those those counters are regiments. It's that's a big game though. Regimental Gettysburg is a big game. Um, that's a pretty fantastic Gettysburg game. Um, I think. I go back and forth on this and whether I think the package uh, of last chance for victory is the better package because it's got an outstanding scenario selection and huge historical and designers notes and all that other stuff. Uh, but I kind of like to play great battles more than line of battle. So, um, you know, there each, each game has upside and downside, but that would have been three dog. Um, Joe Loftus asks, what is my favorite Normandy game? Uh, my favorite Normandy game that you can play in a day is Normandy 44. It's a long day, but you could play it in a day. And my favorite Normandy game that takes a long time to play is uh, the Goss Atlantic Wall. It's the definitive game, the battalion level game, in my opinion. I mean, you, there's people that will say that that's uh, the longest day, but I, I believe the longest day to be di un unpleasantly dated at this point. Uh, Dan Webb mentions real time war games. So that's that's a funny thing is is you know that we also joke about is games that take longer to to finish than the actual thing that they're simulating. Uh, I mean, most monster games that do a single battle fall into that category, right? We played three dog for six months um, before we came to a conclusion, which I think was early on the second day when we decided, yeah, Mead's going to pull out of this bullshit. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's a kind of, it's a punchline that's not particularly useful, I think. I mean, if you're talking about a strategic level game that takes as long to play out as its conflict, then that's probably a problem, right? Um, but, but, I mean, uh the uh like th uh, a world of war doesn't whiff doesn't and those are pretty much the the largest and or most detailed and or most complicated strategic level world war ii games i'm certainly uh i mean you're not going to take 15 years to play out the napoleonic wars for 10 years to play out the napoleonic wars using empires and arms which would be the napoleonic equivalent um so on the other hand um, if you were doing the entire campaign of Der Weltkrieg, it might... I mean, that's not a strategic level game. That's an operational level game with division size units doing all of World War One. So you, it probably would take more than four years to play that out from beginning to end. <clears throat> Make sure I'm putting these in the right place here. John Longshore says he can't look because the cat will take his chair, which will totally happen. That's something that happens in this very chair, in fact. Hex to Hex says he is clipping Atlantic Well right now, which is fantastic. Uh, half S Gaming, uh, I disagree with you there. I think the map for Le Three Days of Gettysburg is better. I think the map and counters for Three Days of Gettysburg are better than the... Um, and here's why. If you look at the battlefield now I've, you know i've seen the battlefield in pictures how many they're both equally attractive maps let me put it that way but um i mean a lot of those like elevation lines on that, that gettysburg battlefield are relatively subtle um on a map scale right and and yet there's something like 25 or 30 different elevation levels on the last chance for victory map and i think that's too many i think that's unnecessarily too many um, and I, I don't think that really adds anything. Um, the three dog map has, I mean, there's, there are significant elevations, you know, on that battlefield, but, um, not to the extent that you need 20 or 30 different elevation levels. Uh, three dog has seven or eight, something like that. And it's, it's just way easier to deal with. Um, it is an equally attractive map. I think I like the Dean cartographic style the dean acid cartographic style which is what last chance for victory is uh, i don't like the counters i think the, the counters for three dog are objectively better 
uh, because they give you more information. They tell you by their color coding what division they belong to, what higher level formation, and what lower level formation they belong to. Um, that is very useful, particularly in a huge battle like Gettysburg, for example. Uh, that was something that we ran into playing in Tetum in um, Line of Battle, for example. Uh, that was... Uh, so, you know, sometimes we would get the, the counters confused because they're not visible. It's not visible enough what lower level formation they belong to about uh, brigades in, in this case. All right. So Stigler mentions, look into the C3I Waterloo offering. It's operational scale, but pretty decent from what I hear. So there's, I think somebody has done some playthrough video of that, which I have watched. I have the game. I will mention that I think it is a more appealing game than the Gettysburg game that uses a related system. Uh, they're both Mark Herman designs. They're both well regarded and getting good press. I believe the granularity of the Gettysburg game is just too low. I think the... For my tastes, the Waterloo game is a little different because it's it is operational rather than sort of bizarrely scaled tactical. Um, so I think it actually works a little, from what I can see. I haven't played either one yet. It looks like it works a little bit better. Um, so uh, John, if if uh, it w probably is not a bad future video topic to do a line of battle versus uh, great battles of the American Civil War. Hell, I might get both of you on the same call and uh, let you argue it out. That that actually would be an awesome video. Um, we should do that. I think I have both of your email addresses, I believe. John Longshore mentions... What could you possibly do to battle of the Bulge Gettysburg or Waterloo that would be new and worthwhile? Well, I mean, I don't think... So, I mean, that's something that... And this isn't quite what you asked, so I'm going to drift a little bit here. People, This comes up all the time. Anytime there's a new Bulge game, somebody chimes in on a board somewhere saying, Why do we need another Bulge game? There's so many Bulge games. Well, that's true, vacuously, but... How many? So, time for trumpets, right? Let's take time for trumpets as our example. It is a battalion level bulge game. How many battalion level bulge games have there been ever? Right? Uh, three, I think. Um, I can't think of any more. Um, I could think of uh, the, the two different versions of Vok Dem Rhine and time for trumpets. And I, th I think that's it. Um, there might be a bigger one or two, uh, another one or two titles that are that same size. Um, now, in this case, uh, you know, the original Vokdam Rhine is, is out of print and it's highly collectible. The current Vokdam Rhine from Decision is still in print and you can still get it. Uh, but just bringing a, that thing back into print might itself be a worthwhile reason to produce such a game. And I always have to stand up for the design impetus by the designer if the designer wants to do a bulge game when the, then they should do a bulge game right whether i want a bulge game or not is irrelevant the designer needs to follow their creative impulses where you end up with mechanically designed trash like we have gotten out of say strategy and tactics for several decades now one of the things that i really 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 strongly like about last chance for victory is there's something like 18 or 20 scenarios in that game that's awesome there's scenarios that are like one map two map three map four map scenarios there's a mini map scenario or two uh it's it has an enormously rich scenario selection and that's generally speaking something that the gamers have been very good at um the scenario selection in Three Days of Gettysburg is not strong. It is, I believe there are three different scenarios. There is, there might be a one map scenario, but it's not a, not a worthwhile scenario. Um, I think you have a, a day one, day two, and day three scenario, and that's basically it. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's a factor. 
Uh, speaking of C3i, Joe Loftus says that new Kursk game is pretty good. Uh, I wouldn't know. My uh, my copy of that is in stuck in the, the the Netherland that is the U.S. Postal Service at this time. Uh, it is coming. Um, I actually I'm going to say this is the case again this time that I didn't buy it for the Kursk game. I bought it for the, the other stuff in the magazine. That tends to be the case for me with C3i. Drang Nak Austin, great name, only improved by Un and Shine, uh, and then Farfagugan, <laughs> which is great. I mean, yeah, the. Uh, yeah, I, <clears throat> so Drang Nak Austin was originally released. It's, it's one of the first monster games, or the first monster game released by GDW. Was was I think two different editions of it came out before they released it again, is somewhat redesigned as Fire in the East, and then it was supposed to get redesigned again by the historical whatever the the clown car guys are that are behind Total War, or not, as the case may be. Uh, Craig Campbell mentions Race for Bastogne. Yes, but but that doesn't cover the whole bulge. That just covers the area around Bastogne. So, I'm also very interested in that, too, as a, uh, you know, a sort of closer look at one of the sort of hot topics around the bulge. Now, if you start saying that you know games that cover part of the bulge count then boy then that really opens you up to a huge quantity of additional titles um ardennes 44 is regimental if i'm not remembering correctly it's not battalions um it's a nice very nice game ardennes 44 is a very nice game it's been a while since i've played it i would like to play it again So, who was it? Uh, somebody shipped... Brant is, is referring to somebody, uh, to a game that was shipped to somebody else. Th this actually happened. I forget who I bought something from, where they gave me a tracking number, and then the tracking number went to somebody in West Virginia. I'm like, what? this was delivered to some Yahoo in West Virginia. What happened? And they, I called them up, and they I hemmed and hawed about it. And, and it turns out they gave me the wrong tracking number rather than they shipped it to the wrong guy. They, it was made right in the last, uh, at the end there. So, oh, the last Blitzkrieg. That's true. That's a battalion scale game as well. I forgot about that. That's interesting because I got a copy upstairs. Um, the last Blitzkrieg is, uh, I mean, boy, the last Blitzkrieg is a great example because it does a bunch of stuff that is completely new to that topic. Um, it, the, the BCS system is very innovative and I just wish that I didn't have as many problems with it as I do because, because there's a, a lot of really, really interesting things that are going on in that system mechanically and I wished I liked it better. And I think the things that I don't like about it are the artillery in the air. Clay mentions, Clay, we've already talked about your campaign for North Africa game, by the way. So don't think that didn't get mentioned. Yep. Uh, so I, I want to say, I, I made sure I got tracking on everything I shipped out. There is one shipment, um, which it hasn't gone yet because I, I boxed it up after I found out I had fucking COVID. Um, and I don't want to send that around. And I don't want to send it around while I still have symptoms. So it's still sitting here. It's literally boxed up and ready to go. All I got to do is to get to the post office. I don't say he's a Yahoo because he went to West Virginia. He's West Virginia. I'm saying he's a Yahoo because he got my game. Or at least that's what it looked like at one point. So, John, I, I think you're right um, about that. John says that, uh, John Longshore says that Monster Game is a big selling point just by slapping it on the box. It's like your best friend daring you to jump off the garage roof. I do think that that's. I do think that that's um, true to a point. Um, there are... Alan, I'll get to your question in just a moment. There are people who will buy monster games with with vague or no intentions of ever actually playing them. I don't do that. At least I try not to do that. I won't say I've never done it. I have sometimes pushed a button impulsively, like 1985 Under an Iron Sky, for example. But... Uh, generally speaking, if I uh, 
if I buy it, no matter how big it is, I think that I really, really, really want to play it, or I think there's a really strong chance that I will play it. Um, but there are definitely some people who, like, everybody that's bought that Decision War in the Pacific, for example, fucking nobody has played that thing. Um, there, there, there was no play test. I mean, there might have been play tests, and they might have play tested little scenarios out of it, but nobody play tested that campaign game, and I'm convinced that nobody has played that campaign game to date. Clay is trying his best, and I've heard rumors that the people have finished campaigns of Campaign for North Africa, but we'll see. Um, but, I mean, people who bought those kind of bought them as shelf warmers. Um, and if that's what you're into, I have no problem with that. It's just not how I, not how I personally roll. Alan says, why do I say S&T has put out trash over the last many years? So if you look back into, I, I am specifically referring to the post-SPI era. I want you to imagine every SPI game put out after SP, S&T 81, I believe, was the last one that SPI did. Every single one. That is 250 plus issues. How many good games are in there? How many games would that you would go find on eBay today because that's a great game and you want to play it again? Now that that number is I I I will tell you that number is probably not zero. And that that the number's gonna vary, right? And the the specific games are gonna vary from person to person. That number is not zero, but it's it's gonna be probably less than fifteen or twenty. And that's a really low hit rate. Um even during the SPI era, while there are a number of classics, a significantly higher proportion, I think, of classics in the SPI S and T era, um, even even SPI, and even under under genius Jim Jim Dunnigan, um, did put out some stinkers or games that just didn't work. They just didn't come together at the end, because in some cases because they didn't have time, or in some cases because it was a hopeless idea. This is not, however, um, a problem limited to S and T magazine games, right? Every, every war game magazine game is probably going to suffer from this to a greater or lesser extent. Um, magazine games, in general, maybe we should do a topic on this. Is uh, have have generally been of dodgy quality right because they're subject to most of the magazines and s&t specifically has tried at least to stick to a magazine publishing schedule something like c3i kind of comes out whenever roger's ready uh, against the odds comes out whenever they're ready um so those magazines have suffered from those problems that are endemic to magazine games a little less actually quite a bit less actually i actually would say that of the magazine games, bearing in mind that I haven't played them all, so I'm giving you my impression rather than an informed opinion, um, of the magazine games that have come out in C3, I, I think at most two of them, and I'm uh, giving myself wiggle room, are turds. Um, at most. Um, I actually think that number is one, and I won't tell you which one, but uh, all the other ones are at least worth a, sh worth a shot, worth a whirl. Um, so, um, I'm not aware of any bad games from Against the Odds either, but, you know, Against the Odds is really, really, really small press. So, um, yeah, it's theoretically quarterly, but I think they I think it's more like one a year, to be honest. So let, let's actually segue, because Hex to Hex is mentioning why people are avoiding monsters, of the challenges of monster games. Okay, Now, one of these big challenges is mitigated now because we have Vassal, and we can, we can not set up our physically huge 55-table thing on a physical table anymore. We could set it up on Vassal, and it doesn't take up any physical room. Um, traditionally, however what we have is a game and you know this this isn't limited to monsters sub monsters will suffer from this as well um if you are not going to finish the game in a sitting then you have to leave it set up which means that you have to be concerned about 
You know, is this on the dining room table that we're going to need tomorrow night? Is this in a room that the cats have access to? Is this a room that the children have access to? Is this something that is going to sit for months and months and months and somebody's going to throw, you know, fold laundry on top of it or something like that? That space consideration, to say nothing of the physical table space required, right? Um, I will tell you that a four map game will fit on two standard sized folding tables. Standard sized folding tables are two and a half feet wide. Those are like the regular folding tables. You go buy them at Costco, they're two and a half feet wide. You could fit a four map game on those, no problem. Uh, plus some external displays to the maps. Um, I can actually fit, I think I can fit Hurtgen Forest on one table, I think. I might be wrong about that, but that's my recollection. Um, then there's the time, right? Do you have people? Now, you know, as somebody that, that did a lot of role-playing, it's not weird for me to have a game that we play once a week, and then we go home, and we come back the next week and play it again. That's not strange, I don't think. Um, from a role player perspective now for a role playing game you don't have to leave your stuff set up right um, everything gets packed up at the end but the idea that we would revisit the same game week after week after week after week carries over into war games right so as long as you have the physical room to put this thing up in and leave it set up for a month or two months or a year or two years or whatever then it's no problem, but not everybody has that uh, that luxury. I don't. I don't have it here. I mean, we got friends in town that do, thankfully, uh, multiple friends in town that do, and that's great for them. But I don't have uh, uh, I don't have the ability to set up a two map game at this very moment. Could I get the folding tables and do it? Yeah, I could, but it's you know then it becomes something I got to work around for for some period of time. I don't really have the ability to desire to do that. Let me put it that way. Um, you also need, I mean, the, the monster games tend to be involved, right? There's no direct correlation between size and complexity. But I've always felt that if you're going to go to the trouble of playing the big game, you might as well make it a meaty game too. That's why I don't like um, uh, the Day of Days, the SCS Normandy game. It's big. I think the rules just aren't meaty enough for me. So... Um, so you have the space, you have the time, or do you have the ability to schedule that weekly session, right? Or whatever it is, bi-weekly or whatever. Although I would suggest that if you have, um, less, you have less than weekly availability, that's really tough for a war game. You're going to have no idea what you came back to. I mean, if we skip a couple of weeks in OCS, I come back and I have no idea what I'm doing. I have no idea what my plan was. I don't know where the supply hubs are. I don't know where the extenders are. And I have to figure it all out again from scratch. So I'm going to recommend that you set aside a regular time slot that is weekly or at most bi-weekly to do it. Um, or the alternative, once again, is to do it on Vassal because um, you, with OCS specifically, is really good on Vassal because you could take that that really time consuming movement pays and take as much time as you need to do it. Tony, we we talked about that earlier, and and I I I, I mentioned my personal definition of what is a monster game, which is based on play time. Um, now that's obviously correlated with the contents of the box. There's more in the box that's going to take longer to play, but there's, it's not it's not quite a straightforward correlation either. There are games that contain a lot of stuff that don't necessarily take a long time to play. Mostly those are euros, though. Um, most war games that contain a ton of stuff will, in fact, take a long time to play. Clay says that. People, he thinks that people give monster war games a bad rap based on assumptions they make and not actually playing the game. For example, Goss, CNA, or Second World War, when these are actually fun games. I actually completely agree. Um, if, if you were there for our Atlantic Wall game at Winterfest, 
uh, a couple years ago, for example, the, um, you know, we are playing Goss and it's like, oh, this is like one of the most complicated games ever, right? And, you know, it kind of is, but it's, we, it wasn't that hard. Once you sit down and actually play it and you have people you can ask questions to and, and you know, when you hit a rules block, a stumbling block, you look it up and you, you can cooperate, collaboratively look it up. That helps. That helps a lot. Um, so, yeah, I think, I mean, a lot of people, like that fellow that I mentioned earlier, for example, uh, has made some assumptions about monster games based on the facts that I just mentioned, that they take a long time to play and they're harder to play test and they take up a lot of space, blah, 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 blah. But then they've never actually tried it. And once they try it, and, and that's another thing that, that I'll mention again, and I'll probably mention it again before we're done, is if you have the opportunity to... Even if you don't necessarily think this is something you'll be into, to go to a big event like WBC or Concert World Expo or something like that and play the same game for like a, several days in a row and you can really get focused on it and you could really never really completely step away from it for a few days. It, it's really immersive. It's a, it's a very different experience. You can actually you can see your plans evolve. Uh, and that's really good. Some people kind of wilt in that environment because they need to spend tons of time to think about what they're doing um and then when they're forced to make decisions because somebody's kicking them under the table because they're going too slow they will screw it up uh but you know and that's the thing too and it, I, I would highly recommend that experience uh to that everybody give it a shot when they can you know maybe after you retire because a lot of folks just don't have time to do this kind of stuff so brent thanks for stopping by uh, Jose Martinez, some subjects for monster games. The Spanish Reconquista, that's actually a super duper um, fascinating topic. Hundred Years War is another fairly interesting topic, but Hundred Years War is not like it's this one contiguous conflict. Not that I think it's impossible, but but it would be a challenging tar a challenging um, topic to do because it, it's kind of it was kind of an on and off hundred years. I mean, they weren't fighting all hundred years, right? So. Uh, but the Reconquista, I think, is a is a very fertile ground uh, for a topic uh, for game for a game. But I don't know that I would necessarily make it a monster game in a monster game format. Again, I think it would be a challenging topic, which doesn't mean nobody should do it because I I would be very interested to see something like that. Hex to Hex uh, says Vassal is hard for him. He wants to see the whole map at once. One of our local face to face guys takes that position as well and i'll say this um you get used to it um you i mean vassal takes some getting used to anyway even if it's not that another thing that helps maybe not completely but helps a lot is to have a large display i mentioned on the stream yesterday at the very end um what i am using as my main vassal monitor is a 42 inch 4k television now, if I bought a 4K computer monitor, it would cost like $1,200 or something crazy like that. But a 4K 42-inch television is like 250 bucks. okay? And you just, I just run the same... Uh, you got to make sure you're using the a uh, HDMI cable that will accommodate 4K. But you just run it, boom, and, and you're there. Now, that tv won't work as well for video games but who cares it, you know that vassal doesn't play like a video game where you have animations and stuff um it it really makes it feel more like a physical board because you can zoom out and still see what's going on still read the the the, the factors on the counters and stuff like that it really helps a lot another thing that really helps with vassal is having multiple displays so i have two displays i have the small display where i keep all the other stuff and then the big display right here where i keep the vassal screen itself then the other screen will be you know streaming software or chat or whatever and then like any tables or displays that i've dragged away from the main vassal display um so for for somebody that's playing like va vassal on a laptop unless it's a really small game I, I feel like that's pretty uncomfortable but if you got a big a big monitor and it, it the the big difference is the 4k and not the not the 42 inches um, I could plot, I could apply a 35 inch uh, 1080 and it, it felt fuzzy if I was zoomed way out. 
uh, 4K makes a big difference. And the good news is, I, I mean, there's probably going to be an 8K at some point in the future, but you, it'll be hard for most people to tell the difference between 4K and 8K, unless it's it's a 150-inch television. <laughs> so, um, Alan mentions, other good monster topics might be 30 Years War. I completely agree. There's a few games on that, but not that many. Um, English Civil War... Russian Revolution. Um, so the biggest Russian Revolution game uh, I am aware of is um, Triumph of Chaos, which is a two-map game. Um, that is a game you could probably... It's probably a 10-hour game, I would say. So I would call it not a monster. I mean, I don't know that monsters have to necessarily be Hex Encounter. But I guess I'll... I'll reframe that question based on my definition of of games that take let, let's call it games that take 40 hours or more to play are there any non-war game examples are there euro game examples that take that long um and don't say twilight imperium because it doesn't take that long it takes a while but it doesn't take that long you could play twilight imperium in eight eight or twelve hours same with civilization or Mega Civilization, or Turbo Civilization, or whatever the new one is. There's, there is a lot of, um, like, feel type of things with Vassal, with the counter handling and stuff like that, and the menus that you do, you do need to get used to. There is a bit of a learning curve to getting that down. And because of the way the Vassal uh ecosystem works and the modules are all done by different people so unless you're like working from a common pool of modules that were developed from the same skeleton like say all ocs games or something like that um, then a lot of things are going to vary from module to module like the hot keys for example will vary from module to module intensely irritating in some cases the hot keys make no sense at all um, or they're not there at all which is probably worse um Craig Campbell mentions a desert storm monster. Um, somebody's probably interested in that, but that somebody was probably not me. I gotta say. Here I stand. Uh, Terrence says that here I stand might not be a monster, but it feels like it. That's an interesting comment uh games that feel like monsters but are not in fact monsters um examples i i mean here i stand to me doesn't feel like that it takes a while to play it's not it's not a fast game but um and i think i think here i stand is a really good game unfortunately it isn't an equally good game for all six factions in the game um and that is a downside to Here I Stand. It's uh, one reason why some people, I think, like the Virgin Queen a little better. Because the sides are a little more evil, evenly engaging than they are in Here I Stand. The, the, the trouble with Here I Stand is a really neat game on a really cool topic. The problem is that it's way in, more interesting to play as either the Protestants or the Papacy than it is to play anybody else. And to play as the French... Or the Turks is really fair. The Turks, I don't know. Maybe you can do something. The French specifically are really uninteresting to play. You have to build a chateau. What the fuck does that mean? I mean, it's it was it's clearly just kind of a mechanism to put in to give the French something to do, uh, and it doesn't really make any sense. The Austrians at least can say, "Hey, uh, my objective is a land conquest of everybody else." And the Turks can at least say, "Hey, we're pirates." So that's something. Um, the, the the English goal is for Henry VIII to have a male heir, I believe. We all know how well that went out. I do, I, I, I mean, I will say in case I'm not being crystal clear about this, um, especially right now where most people are not able to do anything resembling physical play, uh, Vassal is totally worth your time. There's a lot of opportunities, including monster games, but not limited to monster games, that are opened to you 
by, va by the availability of Vassal. Either because, you know, right now you don't know, you know, you, you, don't, you can't meet up with people, um, or you don't know people who are interested in playing some particular game, or you don't have the space to set up some giant-ass thing in your basement. Um, Vassal gets you around all those ideas. There are places where people can meet up to play uh, Vassal games. The best known of which is um, the monthly thread on Board Game Geek, but there's also a Discord server for Vassal matchmaking. There's uh, there's a Facebook group for Vassal matchmaking. So there's tons of people, or tons of places, I should say, uh, where you can organize that kind of play. And even uh, giant ass games get played that way, get get set up that way. Um, I was in a game, Clay might have been in this game too, uh, of Atlantic Wall that was getting played by mail. And I just had to bail because I wasn't able to dedicate the time to it that it needed. However, another thing that I'll mention in regards to Vassal, and this was a factor, one of the reasons why I wasn't able to put the time into it was because at the time, it took me 40 minutes to open the module for Atlantic Wall. What that turned out to be, and I didn't find this out till a fair amount later, is that that's the, there's a virtual uh, machine that runs Java in uh, Vassal is a Java program. Um, if you are running the 32-bit version of Java, you can only increase that cache of virtual memory so big. You can make it much larger if you are using the 64-bit version of Java. Uh, absolutely worth your time to, to install 64-bit Java. But if you just go like, I want to install Java and go find the Java client, probably you're getting the 32-bit version. So at least that's the way it was last time I downloaded it. So and then you can change those, those buffer sizes in Vassal to be much, much larger and really leverage the capabilities of your computer. John Longshore, I have done videos on how to uh, how to play on Vassal, but I think you know how to play on Vassal, so I think you're okay. You've watched enough of my games that I think you probably could figure it out completely cold, even if you hadn't done it before. So Stigler is mentioning that he is uh, he is also a Vassal module designer, um, and I know that he's involved in the Great Battles of the American Civil War effort. And those are generally uh, pretty good modules. So thank you, Alan, for, uh, for, for your labors on our behalf. So you got to... Um, so the, the memory issues are really only a problem with really, really big modules. Um, so it may be an issue that you don't have unless you have a really, really big module. The really, really big modules that I have are the Goss module, well, Atlantic Wall specifically, but the rest of them too. Um, and the Second World War module is enormous, like crazy enormous. So um, I have the, the one for Singapore. Stigler, are we going to see Into the Woods in 2021? Released. That is my question for you at this time. Ziggler does have a channel. You should check that out. Just just search YouTube for, for his name. It'll come up. And he has quite a bit of play, quality play, of the Great Battles of the American Civil War games. Very uh, interested to see uh, what's coming down the pipeline for that series as well. We all know about Into the Woods, but the... The unspoken thing is that there's going to be some kind of uh, Valley Campaigns bonus scenario pack coming down the pipeline at some point as well. Alan, feel free to correct me on that, but I, I think that is, is something that is going to happen at some point. That'll be nice. It's going to be an add-on to Death Valley, uh, which is a wonderful package. It's another one of those games that I would love to see more of, and fortunately we're seeing more of. Um, of these, like, in, in GMT's case, in a lot of cases, what they are are, like, uh, compendium re-releases of older games. So, the Men of Iron Tri-Pack, the, um, the Great Battles of the American Revolution Tri-Pack, the Death Valley is, is all new. Well, it's not all new-new, but it's, it's mostly new-new. Um, it's a huge 
really value heavy package even though it's they're not necessarily the cheapest games in the world they're they're not you know larcenously expensive or anything um, and they're really going to they, they really have a lot of value things like the new version of spqr from i'm, I'm game and gmt game because i have all these um another example though is the uh Roads to Gettysburg 2 from Multiman, right? It, it doesn't sound like it is necessarily if you don't know what's in it, but it's got Roads to Gettysburg, revised, Higher Come the Rebels, revised, and Rebels in the White House, revised. So there's like three, it's like three games in that box. Um, three whole, huge, scenario rich, and, uh, you know, vast vistas of playtime uh, available to you buying those boxes so that is a trend that i love and would like to see more of and death valley is uh, of the stuff that came out last year in the year that shall not be named um it was i think the the best value package in wargaming for the for the entire year cool spring which i've never heard of piedmont second winchester which wasn't that much of a battle but it'd be cool to have just for the sake of completeness. Um, overpriced Navy game. I don't know which overpriced Navy game we're talking about. Wardrobe, thanks for stopping by. Uh, Hex to Hex, the Wilderness game, I don't think we're going to see that this year at this point. Uh, I think I think there's a possibility we'll see it in 2022. I think uh, the, uh, it's going to be called No Turning Back, uh, Line of Battle Game on the Battle of the Wilderness. It's going to be very interesting. I've talked to Chip Farr, the uh, developer. Uh, it sounds very interesting. I think they're going to be really good. They're going to do a really good job on it. My best guess, I th this doesn't come from Chip. This is my best guess. My best guess on release date is no earlier than 2023. So don't count on Wilderness coming anytime soon. Victory at Sea starter box. I don't know what that is. When I hear Victory at Sea, I think Avalon Hill, which was War at Sea and Victory in the Pacific, actually. All right, so these are the container store trays that I keep mentioning. These are five bucks. The big ones are five bucks. They're available in multiple sizes, however. So, now is when I have to look down at this because there's going to be a lot of head scratching as to where these things are going. And I can see already that I'm going to have to rearrange this, so... I think we're just going to go arbitrarily in a couple of different containers. I might end up <coughs> I might end up needing <coughs> funny that I got all the Americans in a tray in a tray and I don't think I can get all the Germans in a tray naval miniatures yeah that's not something I do I mean I, I'm not opposed to miniatures in any real sense I sometimes pretend to be but I just I don't have time for it. I don't have bandwidth for miniatures it's a whole other hobby um Are there monster naval games? Um, I mean, do we count something like War in the Pacific? Maybe we should. Or, um, unless we're doing that, then I think probably the answer is no. Um, or Pacific War, maybe, if you're playing the whole thing. But again, if you're playing the whole thing, it's not just naval, right? So, uh, just naval monster games. Uh, if, if there is one... Um, 
it might be the in development under the Southern Cross from uh, that'll be in the it's it's in the pipeline from Compass and I think that it uh, probably won't be out before 2023 either but don't quote me on that um, I think that is a game that That might qualify, actually. And it's basically a juiced-up flat top. Um, like a super juiced-up flat, like a, with a lot of extra detail. Um, so it's something I'm super interested in because I love flat top. I think it's a fantastic game. But I don't know if... You know, it, it might be too much. It might be overdone. I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see. That was a GMT game that Compass picked up. I'm not sure which game... And, uh, Agri, thanks for stopping by. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm following. You. I'm not sure if we're talking about under Southern Cross or not. Um, Hex to Hex mentions that GCACW is maneuver focused, which is cool and which is completely true. It absolutely is about the maneuver. They are. Oh, did somebody ask about uh, GCACW versus GBACW? Um, they are very different games, showing you very different aspects of Civil War of the American Civil War. Um, one is a battles game, one is a maneuver game. Um, one is tactical or grand tactical, and the other is strictly operational. Um, they are, I think they're both great, to be honest. Um, my preference for Civil War, I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no other game in town for Civil War operational, really. I mean, there, there are some other titles, right? There's the Civil War campaign series from Clash of Arms, for example, which is well regarded by some. Um, it's unsoloable. You can't you can't really solo it because it's all hidden information, which is like the point. Um, that's a problem for some people, but there are vassal modules for them. So there and there are people that like them. I had a couple of them and ended up getting rid of them. I felt like I wasn't going to get any any. I felt like they weren't showing me anything that I can't do with great campaigns better, to be honest. Um, yeah, but again, Clay, uh, Second World War Singapore is Day of Infamy probably might be, but Singapore has a considerable land component as well. So if we're saying naval game has to be just naval, I mean certainly I think the naval mechanics in that thing look worthy of monster game play. Day of Infamy I think is going to be at mostly like ninety eight percent naval. Um, so yeah, I mean I my they're they're both on my short list they both sort of my made the cut list of game series that i'm i'm gonna focus on let me put it that way avalanche press daniel says second world war series games like bismarck um so that is like <clears throat> avalanche press basically does two series of games right now that i'm aware of the great war whatever it is there's there's a great war at sea and a second world war at sea and i think they're basically the same system and panzer grenadier now i've had my run-in with panzer grenadier there's a video on that on the channel go ahead and check that out if you want <clears throat> i'll spare you the trouble and tell you that i didn't care for it at the end of the day um for a variety of reasons that i go into in that video um second world war at sea looks interesting but you know, it's one of those things where I, I don't know. It's it's. Uh, I don't know if it looks sufficiently interesting to to buy one, and it's you know most of them are out of print. Um, there are fans of both series, both Panzer Grenadier and Second World War at Sea and Great War at Sea. Uh, it seems like Avalanche has been distracted a lot by doing like alternate history titles that I, I'm not super duper interested in. Um, but that's me. All right. And to y'all, thanks for stopping by. He says he has a buddy in college who would only play World War II games as the Germans. He would have his fun for the first however many rounds and would usually concede once the tide turned. So lots of fun for him. How do you handle that? I just stopped playing those games with him. That's how I would handle that. I honestly, I mean, <clears throat> so either stop playing those games with him or find different games to play with him that don't work that way. Um, I would be annoyed by that, to be honest. And I would I would be reluctant to keep playing with somebody that stuck with that. Now, maybe we could find something where there weren't Germans, for example. Say, let's play Napoleonics. Um, 
But then you, you're you're going to suffer from the same potential issue. We're going to have then he's going to play Napoleon, right? Where Napoleon runs riot for a while and then uh, eventually gets ground into non-existence. Um, so you know, it's a that's a personnel management question, really. Um. John Longshore talks about game covers, and I agree with him. I, I think the game cover is super duper important. And I won't say I've never bought a game. I, I'm, I'm more likely to have bought an RPG for its cover than a than a war game, I think. Uh, but definitely there are war games with amazing covers that help to sell the game. That is not in doubt at all. We are looking at about 20 more minutes, by the way. We're, we've, all, we've, all, we've been going two hours on these things, so... Um, wardrobe asks whether line of battle is another grand tactical. Yeah, I'd describe it that way. It's regimental level civil war. So that's... I would call that... It's kind of tactical, really. I think the regiment is... For, for most civil war battles, excepting some of the small ones, like the quite small ones... Um, the regimental scale is kind of the, like the the defining scale of the engagement, right? So, I, I would call it tactical, even though a regimental game in a World War II regimental game would probably be operational. Um, so I'd call it tactical. Grand tactical doesn't really mean anything other than what you want it to mean. So. Uh, Wardrobe would like to see a comparison of Line of Battle and GBACW. Well, we have already mentioned, you may not have been here uh, for that, I have already challenged uh, Half-Assed Gaming and Stigler to get together and uh, and we can have that discussion. I, I, am, I, I think there are upsides to both series, to be honest. Um, as I mentioned before, I like the counters and maps better for great battles. I think I like to play it better, um, but the 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 packages for great uh, for line of battle have been very superior, um, specifically the Gettysburg. I mean, there's only uh, three um, line of battle games, right? And there's a there's a decades long history of uh, great battles of the American Civil War. Um, although you could trace line of battle back to the regimental sub series and the Civil War Brigade series and stuff too. Um, Yeah, uh, hex to hex. Uh, that's a good call. Uh, Nick Roser, Rosser, or Roser, um, has a whole series of instructional videos on line of battle that are very, very good. Um, I think the only line of battle title that is in print now is "Drive uh, to Take Washington." It, it's uh, uh, the same topic as "Drive on Washington," the old SPI "Drive on Washington," the Battle of Monocacy. It's got Monocacy and Fort Stevens in it. Um, it's a nice package I have, and I haven't actually played it yet. The one I've played is None But Heroes. That is the uh, Antietam game, which was which I had a wonderful time with. Um, there hasn't been a great Battles of the American Civil War entry on Antietam since A Gleam of Bayonets, which was done by TSR in something like 1986 or 7, something like that. Yeah, I, I'm I'm splitting the difference on the two series. I they both made the cut to me. Um, it's not like I have to shell out money for a line of battle game every six months, right? I mean, they're coming out about once every four years. So um, the and the 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 package, the, the the quality of the package for Last Chance for Victory is just off the charts, just with the, the depth of scenarios and designers' notes and 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 this loving detail in that game is just amazing. And yet, when when our group, our one group, um, wanted to do a Gettysburg game, we ended up playing Three Dog instead. So, that I mean, that should tell you something. That might have been because somebody squawked at the written orders, which is technically optional, but I highly, highly, highly recommend playing Line of Battle with the written orders. It adds an enormous amount of of immersion to the game.
Uh, Clay mentions, good topic uh, to mention is playing with or without Plexi. Um, I would be inclined to not do a live stream on that subject, um, and, but it would be a good video topic to just the ins and outs of dealing with Plexi. The fact is, I'll tell you what the, the – so I recommend playing with Plexi. In a lot of cases, I put Plexi over a mounted map because the mounted map's not laying flat enough for me. Um, I, optimally, I would like to not do that with a mounted map, but I'll, I'll always use Plexi. Some people don't. I don't understand how they can do that. Um, I'll knock it, knock stuff over and spill drinks on it and all that kind of stuff, and, and Plexi prevents me from doing that. I can write on it um, with a dry erase marker, um, and if I you know need to write the combat odds down, I can do that while I'm calculating them. I've done that on video in a couple cases. Um, I'll always play with Plexi. As far as what kind of Plexi, to be honest, I play with whatever clear Plexi Lowe's happens to have. Um, I don't like run around looking for Plexi. Now, I do have some sheets of uh, the anti-glare Plexi or the, gl the glare-resistant Plexi, which were deliberately sourced. Um, it's a bit disappointing. <laughs> the the anti-glare Plexi is a bit disappointing. Uh, I would, in some cases, uh, or a related concept is is mounted versus unmounted maps. There are many people prefer mounted maps, and, you know, I kind of like to have a mounted map, too. But the fact is, in many ways, if you're going to put Plexi over it, a paper map is just as good. Um, I, you know, for me, the mounted maps in the new WIF are not a selling point, particularly. I, I think it'd be easier to store the game if they were unmounted. Um I'm happy to put a piece of Plexi over it. That's fine. Um, it protects the, the game. It protects the map from wear and tear. Um, it protects the map from casual skill spills. Not serious spills. If you like dump your big gulp on it and it's going to go under the Plexi, you're just hosed. But uh, Sean mentions that poster frames is, are good. Yeah, they're not as cheap as I keep hearing people say, oh, this is only like $2. No, the, like the, the poster frames that will hold a poster size map run 10 or $15 at Walmart. So they're not quite as cheap as all that. Uh, but that might be cheaper than, than Plexi, right? And you generally want a, a quite thin piece of Plexi optimally because it will like decrease the refract weird refraction effects that you get. Um, but if it's too heavy, then it might tend to pooch on its own. And that's also undesirable. Another thing that, that a lot of that I see a lot of folks do is they'll they'll actually put a, a backing under the map too. They'll, they'll use like some piece of foam insulation board or a piece of that uh, what's that st the MDF stuff um, as like an underlay for under the map. We did that with um, the uh, G GTS Market Garden game. And that, that saved us when a spill did occur, actually, because the spill went under the, the, the styrofoam and not under the map. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, Chris, if you look, just look, Google, go to walmart.com and just look at poster frames. And there, it's just a thin piece of, of plastic, like acrylic plastic, with like a, a long clips on the edges and a piece of cardboard in the back. Um, and if you get one that's 24 by 36, it'll fit a standard size war game map. Uh, John Longshore mentions the WIF game that Matrix Games put out. So, they, so, and I actually thought about ordering those actually because they had them on sale. Uh, they were part of their winter sale, which I think is over as of a couple of days ago. Um, they had them on sale for like 80% off, so that this whole the map set was like 20 bucks, but it was like 40 dollars to ship it. Um, so I didn't order them. Um, the what that is is there are the entire you're probably aware if you're aware of WIF that the like the Pacific maps are at a different scale than the European maps. Um, the Africa map is at a different scale than the European maps. The, the Americas maps are at a different scale than the European maps. Um, what the Matrix Games WIF maps are is the entire world, the entire planet, North America's included, at the European scale. So it's some there's something like 22 feet long by 11 feet high or something like that. It's bananas. You can have, I mean if you can print your own maps, you can have them printed on like vinyl and stuff. That's possible. Um 
friend of mine um, is big into print and play games, and he has had uh, his print and play games, the maps printed on these huge vinyl sheets. Now, the DPI resolution from Vistaprint, which is where he went, was pretty low, but it was printed big enough that it wasn't a hindrance. I was, I've ordered some of my, the first round of Avalon, uh, of uh, Arvel Star t-shirts actually were from Vistaprint. I wasn't happy with them. The current range from uh, Teespring I'm much happier with. Merch store. Link in the description. All right, Hex to Hex. Thanks very much for stopping by. We are pretty close to being done anyway. Um... We're going to run for two hours here, so we have about another 10 minutes if anybody has any final questions they would like to ask. We have hit a record. Uh, I think at our highest, we were at 66 people, 67 attendees here. Um, my wife would like to thank you all for, for stopping by. She said you should thank those people who are in your live streams because they are listening to you so I don't have to. Because otherwise, she would be here pulling her hair out. So I'm very happy with the t-shirts. Um, I need to find my extra stash of teeth because I have several that I, they're in a tote of clothes somewhere. I don't know where they are. Coffee mugs are also available now, by the way, and, and masks, but I'll probably, nobody's ordered a mask. I'll probably can the masks. Terrence, you know, nobody asked this, actually. I, I won't say nobody, but it's been a long time since somebody's asked me this. Um, so, Ardwolf's Lair, the YouTube channel, has been around for like 10 years. And, whew, or more than that, it might be 12, 11 or 12, actually. Um, but I started out, as you might know if you've looked at the really ancient stuff in the channel history, um, uh, you might know that I started out doing video game coverage. And prior to having a YouTube channel, I had a blog. Now, the blog's still there. Um, it, was a, uh, it was on a platform, a video game community platform that doesn't exist anymore, and I can't remember the name of it. And then when it went away, or when everybody left, I went to WordPress. And the WordPress blog has been around since something like November of 2007. Um, and my what got me started blogging was a MMORPG called Vanguard Saga of Heroes. And Ardwolf was the name of my character in Vanguard. Um, and I just picked it up and ran with that. And it's been like that ever since. And it's a bit confusing for people sometimes. But um, it's, you know, I'm not like hiding. Everybody knows who I am at this point. But... Um, it's it has become kind of a brand thing. Um, the 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 logo was done by a friend, and then I have modified it very slightly. The actual art part was done by the friend because I can't do that. Um, so not D and D, but it was it was an MMORPG character. Not my first MMORPG character, but the first one I was probably attached to. John Longshore mentions that Mongoose is killing him with this glut of new travel books. Yeah, they just released another one. Um, so we're going to do, um, I might do it as live actually tomorrow because I don't have the video ready. Uh, the, the flip through of, uh, the Mongoose Traveler second edition Aliens of Charted Space Volume 1. Um, so we might do it live. Why not? That'll be, if I'm doing it live, I'm doing it whenever I get up. So sometime around, um, noon or something like that. It'll 10, 10 a.m. is my usual release time. I don't know if I'll be available to do it at that time. Uh, my first D and D character, which would have been basic D and D, uh, the the Moldve basic D and D was a thief as well, and that was because the first adventure he went on was Blizzard Pass, which was a solitaire adventure uh, for a first level thief, and I was always very attached to the thief in back in those days. So I'll mention since since we we brought up Traveler. Um, I'll mention that another uh, RPG has come to my attention. That's, that's really, this isn't new that it's come to my attention, but I just got it. It is a game called Against the Dark Master, and it is a retro clone. I think explaining exactly what that means for those who don't know is probably beyond the scope of this video, uh, but it is, it is a 
heavily inspired. It's not really a retro clone, but it's it's heavily inspired by Rollmaster and the Middle Earth role playing game, the old Iron Crown Middle Earth role playing game, which I played both of which I played a ton of back in the day. And I'm reading through the PDF, and it looks insanely attractive right now to me. Um, I don't have a setting for it. It's got a very loosey goosey setting that is basically here's the setting. There is an evil lord called the Dark Master. That's the setting. <laughs> And then you have, it gives you some tools on how to flesh that out and stuff like that. But that's basically all the setting there is. It's, it's all up to you. Um, so I was actually thinking of doing some, some interesting things with it. Uh, using maybe some of the old Shadow World modules or something like that. But we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, I'm wait, awaiting the physical book, which is still shipping to the Kickstarter backers. I don't have an so I have not done regular RPG play in about ten years. Um, I will do RPG stuff at like Origins, which of course didn't happen this year. Typically, actually, for the last couple of years, last several years, really, I've done more RPG stuff at Origins. Like as far as like events that I buy tickets for, I've done more. I've done a lot of wargaming stuff at Origins too. But that's basically hanging or me hanging around hassling Brandt um, or or taking pictures. Um, as far as like um, events that I buy tickets for, it tends to be role playing events because I don't have a regular group. I know people in town. There's plenty of people. It's just that I don't uh, work. Got, I had a group. Work got in the way, and now I'm you know technically I could start something now, but then there's always a chance work could get in the way sometime soon. So I would and and we got COVID. So there's that that's in the way as well. So anything that I do is going to be an online thing, which is great for uh, for everybody who is interested in that because that's it's on here because I can broadcast it, right? Um, so no, I don't have a I don't have a group right now, and I haven't for a long time. Matt Chestnut said he doesn't see a need to move on from AD and D Second Edition. It was perfectly. You know what? If it's working for you, yeah. There, there is, there is no reason to move on. You are absolutely right. That is, one hundred percent accurate to say. If you are happy with your rules platform, don't worry about it. You know, and feel free to stick. Uh, feel free to steal stuff from other sources, but stick with the rules you like, right? Uh, Clay says, "Are there RPG war game settings? Something like the War Game Ranger?" So. What do we mean by that? I've been planning for years. Well, not planning, because planning implies that I put serious thought into it, and I haven't put enough thought into it, um, about doing a video on the interface between RPGs and war games. Um, there have been games that reside on that interface. For example, for instance, there is, I forget which one it is, but there's a Dragonlance module from the original Dragonlance series that is a war game of the War of the Lance um, there is a, a uh, expert module called Red Arrow Black Shield, I believe, that is basically a D&D known world war game. And to say nothing of the various attempts to turn D&D into a miniatures game, or, uh, or back into a miniatures game, if you like. Um, there's um, a game called Recon from Palladium Books, very early Palladium Books item that you might take a look at. Um, I mean, a lot of games, a lot of role-playing games, even now, have war game elements. The current version of D&D retains some war game elements. The last edition of D&D, 4th edition, had tons of war game elements. I mean, it's like super tactical, right? Because you're playing, it's a man-to-man -man thing. Uh, but, I mean, you could play that as a war game if you wanted to. And some people probably did. It's one of the reasons why... It's like it's it's both a weakness and a strength of D and D fourth edition, which again is beyond the scope of this video. I think fourth edition gets a bad, bit of a bad rap, but I understand why a lot of people had the reaction to it that they did, which is very negative. Um, so there have been examples. There are also there's an entire range of traveler war games. For example, for instance, we have Ajanti High Lightning, which is boarding actions. Uh, we have, hopefully that was not too loud on the stream. Um, we have. Fifth Frontier War, which is the Fifth Frontier War. This is an op... It's called Strategic on the Box. It's not. It's an operational game. Um, 
there's the classic Imperium that spawned the entire official Traveler universe in the first place, which is a war game of which I have about four copies. Um, so, um, and we have Invasion Earth, Dark Nebula at the top. Dark Nebula is just a, a, a redone um, Imperium, really, with a different map. Um, there's Mayday and Snapshot, which are uh, ship combat and man-to-man -man combat uh, for Traveler, but as a board game. So there's an enormous, um, there's an enormous uh, interface in Traveler between RPGs and war games. Um, now you can always put. I mean, a lot of people will put role-playing elements into their war game, like the like the like the dork that brings his Napoleon hat to. Uh, to, to the Napoleonic game, right? You know, that's kind of a role-playing thing. Um, you can insert role-playing elements into your written orders in a game of Line of Battle, for example. That's one of the things that's cool about that. Um, so there, there is an overlap. Maybe this will be the topic of our next live stream, Maxi, is the overlap and interface between RPGs, because I'd like that discussion to be a little bit interactive, like we get in these live streams with, with people challenging the bullshit that I'm saying, right? Instead of just me opining. That's the, it's the attractive thing about doing this. So. All right. It is 10 o'clock. We have gone for two hours. Um, I would like to thank everybody enormously for stopping by. Again, we've hit another record this evening. Uh, please do tune in tomorrow. At some point, there will be a Traveler video. Um, or relatively early in the day. And then at 8 p.m. tomorrow, there's going to be another live stream. This time I will be interviewing Bruce Maxwell, designer of NATO, The Next War in Europe, forthcoming in a uh, spiffy-looking new edition from Compass Games. So uh, stay tuned for that. Bruce has been making the rounds on this. The game will be out very, very shortly. So it is a thing that I am looking forward. You know, it wasn't something that... I was super interested in and then you know i talked to bruce at compass expo last year and um the uh th that was like oh this actually sounds kind of cool and then i've talked to other people since then about how cool the original game was and i've watched several interviews with or read several interviews with bruce where he's talking about what he's doing with it and it, it sounds like a really 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 solid package and i think uh if you're interested in it at all tune in tomorrow night so again i'd like to thank everybody um, for stopping by. We'll be back next Monday with a random topic. Maybe the RPG, uh, maybe the RPG, uh, war game thing. That's actually a good idea. I will not commit to that at this time until probably Friday or Saturday though. And then tomorrow night is Bruce Maxwell. Tomorrow afternoon or morning is Traveler, uh, flip through. And then on Thursday, we have an unboxing of Don't Tread on Me, which is a solitaire American Revolution game from Ben Madison and White Dog Games. Once again, everybody have a great and safe night. Please, uh, <coughs> everybody get cozy here in the winter, and we'll see you all again soon.